You blame society. You don't have an answer. So it must be a conspiracy. There must be some sort. And you're just asking questions. You don't know. Right? This is the game that is played by so many corrupt commentators. Just asking questions. I don't have to show you evidence that something terrible is happening. I don't have to actually demonstrate how the thing is happening. I don't have to tell you who the problem is. Wink, wink. But I can just tell you right now that there is a problem. But even if, and, and if I'm asked about it, hey, I'm just asking questions. Now, let me tell you something about just asking questions for a second. Just asking questions is a game for children. My son is seven. He can just ask questions. My daughter is 10. She can just ask questions. If you are 50 and you are just asking questions, I don't think you're just asking questions. I think that your level of curiosity is actually quite low. I think that you don't care enough to know or know enough to care. I think that the vast majority of people who are in the just asking questions business have an answer that they want to suggest, but they know there's no evidence for it. So instead they hide behind just asking questions. In other words, they're completely full of it's really impossible to discuss the fall of Ben Shapiro from an objective standpoint due to the fact Ben has always been a highly controversial figure with detractors from the beginning. There was no rise of Ben Shapiro for leftists, anti-Zionists and those on the dissident right who were wise enough to spot Ben for what he was many years ago. I'll be discussing Shapiro's rise and then fall instead from my perspective as someone who grew up with what I would call a default liberal worldview, who grew disenfranchised with left-wing liberal politics and sought an alternative to these politics, before eventually following many of the things I had learned through to their obvious conclusion and arriving at what some may call the dissident right. While Ben came across my radar and then mainstream as a whole in 2016-2017, he'd long been since making waves in American politics. Ben was born in California to a wealthy Ashkenazi Jewish family. Both of his parents worked in Hollywood. Shapiro went from Walt to Reed Middle School in the Valley to an Orthodox Jewish prep school, Yeshiva University High School of Los Angeles, where he graduated in 2000, age 16. Ben graduated from Harvard Law School before working as a lawyer for 10 months at Goodwin Proctor, before ultimately committing himself to a life in politics. Long before this, however, Ben had already begun making political content, starting a nationally syndicated column when he was 17 years old, becoming the youngest nationally syndicated columnist in the United States, and had written two books by age 21. Whether Ben's successes at such a young age came from his intelligence, or due to his parents having connections in Hollywood, or both, I'll let you decide. Ben landed his first major political gig, becoming editor-at-large of Breitbart, founded by Andrew Breitbart, under the leadership of Steve Bannon. However, Ben would resign from Breitbart in 2016 over the site's handling of Donald Trump's campaign manager's alleged assault on reporter Michelle Fields. Andrew's life's mission has been betrayed, Shapiro wrote. Indeed, Breitbart News, under the chairmanship of Steve Bannon, has put a stake through the heart of Andrew's legacy. In my opinion, Steve Bannon is a bully and has sold out Andrew's mission in order to back another bully, Donald Trump. He shaped the company into Trump's personal Pravda. Ben, along with partner Jeremy Boring, founded the online publication The Daily Wire in 2015, which produces a wide array of content from online podcasts, articles, and even films and TV shows. The Daily Wire has since grown a gigantic audience of American conservatives, partly due to Ben's ability to go viral. The Daily Wire would cash in majorly on the online culture war, with many videos of Ben debating college students going viral. Shapiro, well-educated in politics, would make his much younger and inexperienced debate partner look foolish in comparison. These videos satiated many people's desires to see arrogant and unhinged social justice warriors put in their place. Say that some people don't have privilege when you basically just said that trans people aren't valid. They're not a thing. They're just girls pretending to be boys or boys pretending to be girls. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so I was excited. Okay. but gender is a completely different thing. No, gender is not disconnected from sex. So. It's not completely disconnected, but it's still a cultural thing. It's still from society. Okay. No, it is not in the mind. Okay. You're not a man if you think you're a man. And I didn't say pretending. Or if I did, I shouldn't have said pretending. Let me amend. Said playing. Okay. I said a boy who thinks he's a girl. That's the usual phraseology I use. Not playing. I usually say a boy who thinks he's a girl or a girl who thinks he's a boy, which is technically what we're talking about here. As far as the actual psychological issues, at play, it used to be called gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, now they call it gender dysphoria. The idea that, that sex or gender are malleable is not true, okay? And I'm not denying your humanity if you are a transgender person. I am saying that you are not the sex to which you claim to be. You're still a human being and you're a human being with an issue that I'm, you know, I wish you Godspeed in, in dealing with in whatever way you see fit. But if you are going to dictate to me that I'm supposed to pretend, I'm supposed to pretend that men are women and women are men, no, 
My answer is no. I'm not going to, I'm not going to modify basic biology because it threatens your subjective sense of what you are. Okay, but you're still saying these kids should like not be accepted because they don't really fit in either place. They can't just like I'm saying that the Boy Scouts have a standard. You must be a biological boy to be a Boy Scout. You have to be a boy to be a Boy Scout. Is that written, though? In the name Boy Scouts. <laughs> the Daily Wire appeared during this time to be a decent alternative to the left-wing vice gripped media, with Ben and other personalities who orbited around him coming out in support of freedom of expression and anti-censorship, which had and still is badly affecting the right. In between all of Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire's content covering the culture war and American politics was an unbelievably strong and unwavering support for Israel. While Ben's support for Israel shouldn't shock anyone down to his familial background, the extreme measures he supports in defense of Israel should, especially as it contrasts massively with what he preaches for Americans, where Ben takes on more of a classical liberal approach where everything is about ideas and not people. Do you ever wonder if one day you'll have to flee the United States? I mean, I think that every Jew throughout world history who has a brain and knows history has always wondered if a country that is not a Jewish state is going to eternally provide them security guarantees and full citizenship, of course. I mean, that, that's, uh, I think, to, to think that that's why the existence of the state of Israel is the single greatest guarantor of my loyalty to the United States, frankly. Right? Because Israel exists, that means the United States is going to be a more welcoming place for me because Israel is there as a backstop in case anything should go wrong. But I feel you try to dodge the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask it, it uh, bluntly. <laughs> Why won't you make Aliyah to the state of Israel? Because you can take because, the night to think about it, uh, by the way. <laughs> because the fundamental principles of the United States are good, eternally good, and worth upholding. And my fight to do that as a Jew is deeply important, not just to people who are not Jewish, but particularly to Jews. So in other words, my Jewish mission does not conflict with my presence in the United States, or my citizenship in the United States, or my loyalty to the United States. Shouldn't Jews live in the state of Israel? Shouldn't all Jews live in the state of Israel? All Jews, the Jews. Jews should live where they can do the most, where they can be a light to the nations. And for me, as a person with millions and millions of followers in the United States, promoting what I think are values that are eternally good, living in, it, living in the United States is a point of, of, I think, morality for me. To quote a few passages from Ben's article, Transfer is Not a Dirty Word, written in 2003, some people have rightly suggested that Israel should be allowed to decapitate the terrorist leadership of the Palestinian Authority, but this too is only a half measure. The ideology of the Palestinian population is indistinguishable from that of the terrorist leadership. Here's the bottom line. If you believe that a Jewish state has a right to exist, then you must allow Israel to transfer the Palestinians and the Israeli Arabs from Judea, Samaria, Gaza and Israel proper. It's an ugly solution, but it's the only solution. And it is far less ugly than the prospect of bloody conflict. When two populations are constantly enmeshed in conflict, it is insane to suggest that somehow deep-seated ideological change will miraculously occur, allowing the two sides to live together. Infamously, in 2010, Shapiro stated that Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. Quite clearly a Jewish supremacist statement. It's hard to imagine if Europeans stated something similar about their people that they would go on to run a multi-million dollar publication, a feature on major podcasts and news channels. Ben also wrote an article in 2008 called The Case for Israeli Settlements, where he said that the world should be far less concerned about Israel's settlement policy than about the terroristic, fascistic nature of Israel's enemies. Quote, Supporters of the so-called two-state solution, in reality a piecemeal attempt to dismantle the state of Israel by making its borders indefensible, assume a moral equivalence between Israel and her enemies. They argue against Israeli settlements as if Israel was America and its Arab neighbors Canada, as if the Arab-Israeli conflict was a simple border dispute. In reality, Israel shares Western values, its enemies share values with the mullahs. The Arab-Israeli conflict is a conflict between two contrasting worldviews, freedom and fascism. The above piece is quite important as it shows how many Christians and those new to right-wing politics get sucked into the Israel trap, unfortunately myself included many years ago. Often, people new to right-wing politics are looking for an alternative to the insanity of the modern left and progressivism, however they initially still hold entirely all liberal values about the world which have yet to be shedded. As all major conservative or classical liberal pundits push this liberal worldview, 
merely stating that the only fault of the modern left is that they've gone too far. This is then how Ben, The Daily Wire and Turning Point USA can suck many Americans into the Israel cause. They will contrast the openness and liberalism of Israel against the extreme Islamic views of every other nation in the region, stating, look, we must support Israel. It's a democratic country that stands alone against this ideology, which has inserted itself into Europe, an ideology which the US has been fighting wars against for 20 years. I was very pro-Israel before this trip, um, but I'm just on fire to continue to advocate for this moral and godly country, seriously. And I'll kind of walk you through the last 48 hours. It was a real eye-opening experience for me. The Western media has become so good at lying about this country. And again, I'm very, very pro-Israel. I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm a conservative. I'm a Trump supporter. I'm a Republican. Um, all, all the good things. For my whole life, I have defended Israel. But even with that, I was programmed by the Western media to have certain lies programmed into my head. So for example, we were on the hill yesterday in Hebron, and I asked, where, where are the tents? No, seriously. I said, where are all the refugee camps? I've been told my entire life that this city is a refugee city. And they, they, you know, everyone laughs, there's malls, there's shopping centers, it's 97% Arab. And it was so eye-opening to actually see it firsthand because I went in thinking it was going to be an actual refugee camp. So that was an eye-opening experience. And then today, um, we had an amazing opportunity. We flew in a helicopter all the way up to the Golan Heights, which, I mean, I'm going to, for the rest of my life, and hopefully in this presidential term, advocate for the international community to recognize the Golan Heights as part, a true part of Israel. Where it all kind of came together was when I was asking, you know, our, our wonderful um, helicopter pilot, who is a hero from the first uh, Lebanon war, amazing guy, and he was walking me through all the different zones, and I said, when will it be enough for the Arabs? Like, when, when will it be enough? And he said it very simply, so when all the Jews are dead. And it hit me, it said, if you do a thought exercise, a hypothetical, which is if the IDF took 10 days off, what would happen? Israel would be gone, would be gone and the Jews would be you know, have be, become persecuted again. If all the Arab nations took 10 days off, no armaments, everything would remain the same. Everything. Which side is moral and which side is immoral? You know, something that I'm going to use really when, in my advocacy in the States and the media that I do is, how could anyone be occupying their own land? Can anyone explain that to me? Because the Jews have been living in this land for thousands and thousands of years. And again, I always knew this, I always believed this, but you know, this amazing organization and Matan and your entire team did an unbelievable job of showing that to me. It really did. It's, it's very scary and this is why, you know, the work on American campuses is so important to educate about this, you know, this wonderful and beautiful country. And Worst of all, Ben is an interventionist who supported the Iraq War. The wars in the Middle East were to America what both world wars were to Europe. Senseless wars that destroyed not just empires, but the excellence and confidence of great civilizations. To anyone familiar with Bush's advisors or the Clean Break Memo, you'll know well that the Iraq War was not about oil, and exactly why Shapiro has always been a champion for American boys going off to die in the Middle East. I will link Keith Woods' excellent video on the topic below. On the record, Ben states that the wars were necessary to spread democracy and free people, but even as a diversion to his actual reasoning, it's, this is also highly problematic. Sovereignty encompasses more than people simply getting a choice in who rules them but extends to the right of people to forge their own futures in the nation that they belong. Not the US coming in, destabilizing their country, establishing a regime foreign and ill-fitting, then leaving. This is not a moral good. Shapiro along with other Conservative Inc members such as Dan Crenshaw and Charlie Kirk were opponents to Donald Trump in his initial presidential run. Ben in a 2016 article wrote that he would never vote Trump and reiterated this numerous times throughout the article, stating that Trump was not a real conservative and would not put conservative judges on the Supreme Court, which was of course not true. It was only during Trump's presidency, where he resembled more of a typical George Bush-esque Republican, that the likes of Shapiro, Kirk and Crenshaw would support him, and not when Donald Trump represented one of the first major anti-establishment candidates in America during his first presidential run. Also worth noting that today Trump's term in office was one of the most pro-Israel terms of any president post Harry Truman. 
And just like that, the status quo was set. New conservative establishments such as the Daily Wire and Turning Point USA rose to prominence off the back of the culture wars. Hushing up the fact that they were actually opponents of Donald Trump, these organizations would list and reiterate the same talking points to their audience. Free speech, anti-censorship, America first, supposedly. Free market capitalism, anti-communism and anti-fascism. These beliefs all seem second fiddle to one issue that would dominate these publications every time a conflict reared its head in the Middle East. The Israel issue. Ben and Charlie Kirk, who had been telling their audiences for years that any sort of identity politics is evil, would go on multiple speaking tours about how Israel and its people were the most moral and important in the world. They even dragged poor Jordan Peterson into it. You have a tremendous moral responsibility, like you have perhaps for your entire history, for reasons that are very difficult to understand. And I think it is true in some real sense that the fate of the world depends on the decisions of the people of Israel, just as the fate of the world depends. <laughs> just as the fate of the world depends on the decision of every individual. So you make yourself a shining light on the hill, right? You attract people here because of what you're capable of doing. You show the world what the holy city... ...could look like. Because we need it. We need it. And it's up to you to do it. Thank you very much. This began ringing alarm bells for some. Why are identity politics okay for Israel, but not Americans or Europeans? Why does Israel get a massive amount of aid from the US every year, some of which it's actually exempt from spending on US weapons? Why is the largest donor to the Republican Party by some distance buried in Israel, in Sheldon Adelson? Why does questioning any instance of Israeli hostility toward the US immediately get one blacklisted? These are questions being asked by one group in particular, Nick Fuentes and the Groypers. Nick is an American first paleoconservative political commentator and one of the most blacklisted men in the West. In Nick's own words, he'd been coming through the usual conservative ink pipeline in college and high school until he started questioning aid given by the US to Israel. Upon this, Nick became immediately shunned by his fellow colleagues and was shut out from these young Republican grassroots programs. It's not like the rich or some global elite or, or the United Nations. Pretty straightforward. So. Here I am, a right-wing college guy, waving the flag, saying, yeah, America first all day. But if you look in conservative media, all they talk about is Israel. And I thought that was very conspicuous. Prager University, Breitbart, Daily Wire, they would have three articles that totally made sense to me. Like, here's the case for low taxes. Here's the case for, you know, having kids, not having kids out of wedlock. Here's the case for whatever. And then, and then they'd have an article like, here's why Palestine has to be wiped off the face of the earth. I'm still in touch with all those guys that worked at Daily Wire, and, um, but it, it started to get kind of contentious because we would go places, like I went to the Christmas party, the like, you know, West Massachusetts, Republic, young Republican Christmas party, and I'm with Cassie Dillon, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm asking her these questions like, hey, like, why do we send, because I'm, you know, we're all political, this is the stuff we talk about, right. I'm like, you know, why do we send all this money over this? There and why are we at war in Iraq and blah 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 and and at first they're kind of like playing it off they're like oh haha ha, very funny and then they're like okay no but like seriously stop asking like you know we can have that conversation but the way you're posing the question is hateful and anti-semitic and I said well like wow they always I can't believe they're using the feminist language yeah that's what that's what the feminists would do. That's what they jump to. If yeah. you ask a question, you're an anti-Semite. And and so I just wouldn't stop. I just kept pushing and pushing and and this was the text. And me and me and her were like good friends and everything. And and she had this big affinity for me. She I literally have a text that she sent to Shapiro. Mm -hmm that she had sent to me where she said, you gotta take this guy under your wing. He's so impressive. Like, I like this guy, whatever. And so she texts me and we were like, you know, it's not like there was any uh, falling out personally. It was just over politics. She sent me a message and said, Nick, I can no longer talk to you. We are no longer in the same movement. What you're pushing is dangerous and hateful and anti-Semitic and blah, blah, blah. Never talk to me again. The whole crew blocked me on Twitter, stopped talking to me. And then I got a call from my boss at RSBN a week later 
this guy, Joe Seals, and he says, Cassie has been calling me every day for the last two weeks saying that I need to fire you because you're racist and you're an anti-Semite. So not only does she cut off the friendship and blacklist me, but then she starts calling my boss. This was when Nick branched out on his own, reigniting Pat Buchanan's America First movement. Nick in his early days was extremely concerned with optics, shedding the traditional image of right-wingers put forward into the minds of the public by Hollywood, encouraging his followers to attend Turning Point USA and Daily Wire events, well-dressed, well-groomed, and with articulately written questions to expose the agenda behind these conservative Inc. organizations. The question is, if the president were to enact a policy that would completely benefit the United States and her citizens, but to the detriment of Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a false choice. Thank you for being here. I get a lot of questions about Israel in the last week. I <laughs> yeah, will not yeah. Apologize for my defense of our greatest ally in the Middle East. Yeah. I will not apologize. We know for you the won't, bitch. <laughs> epic, epic. Critics both domestically and abroad. Part of the issue I see here is, um, what's your name, Rob? Yeah. So you're yeah. saying, oh, this, you're behind the times. This isn't conservative. Well, we don't want centrists in the conservative movement. We yes! Want to our yes! Values. Yeah. Yes! We don't want yes! Yes! But here's the thing. But here's the thing. It's not about what you want because here's the thing. The beauty, the beauty about social media, the beauty about social media is that I can be me and I can bring myself to the table. And it's not about what you want. It's about this the, is the so ethic. Do you and know how incredible this is? This Three, one after the hey, other. Rock Racist question that was. <laughs> He's got this real fun, button. lighthearted question for you, Charlie. Uh, so I know you gave a speech uh, in Jerusalem early this year. Yes, uh, I did. Uh, were there any like awesome, fun dance parties that you guys had afterwards? Because I heard that Israelis are some of the best dancers in the world. Uh, I mean, if you guys don't believe me, just Google dancing Israelis. Yo, Israelis. yo! Would you agree or disagree with that? That's amazing. A country, a great country too. The Groyper War was a huge success for Nick and the America First movement and had the effect of proving that many personalities in Con Inc. were guilty of the same tactics that they long accused left-wingers of, that being resorting to threats, insults, and name-calling rather than dealing with the Groyper's questions, banning Nick from all the events, and really not being right-wing at all, instead just espousing talking points 10 years behind modern liberals. Ben even changed his entire speech to preempt the Groyper's presence at his event after Turning Point USA's events had been utterly decimated the week before. That I have switched the topic of the speech. I've decided to talk about something else and you're all just going to have to deal with it because I have the microphone. Tonight I'm going to talk about the dangerous game that's being played by two particular nasty groups who feed off one another. I'm speaking about the radical left and the alt-right. Now. I discuss the radical left on campus all the time. That's because campuses are dominated by the censorious and nasty radical left. On the other hand, I actually did question whether I wanted to talk about the alt-right tonight. One reason is because what the alt-right wants more than anything else in the world is attention. Ben insulted Nick's fan base, essentially calling them basement dwellers racists, and stated that Nick's followers were lying regarding Ben's allegiance to Israel over the US, with Ben stating that he would indeed support a policy that was good for the US, even if it was bad for Israel. Step two, then you declare yourself the true conservatives, the true heirs to conservatives. We are the, yeah, we always right, Not that. a bunch of masturbating losers who live in your mother's basement. No, you're the true heirs of conservatism. Masturbating losers who live in the their you parents' do this basement. Is that you there it is again. There it is again. Yeah, not everybody Ben Shapiro can uh, have their parents foot the bill for elite private Jewish school in Los Angeles. Not everybody can use their father's connections to get them into UCLA and go to law school and get them set up with Hollywood producers. And that's literally what it is. Where's Jeremy Boring's background? Anybody remember Jeremy Boring, co-founder of The Daily Wire? What's his background in Hollywood? What's the background of Ben Shapiro's father and mother? They work in entertainment. He was born in LA. Hollywood people propped him up and created the, 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 the Daily Wire. Where was he five years ago? He was on Piers Morgan. The guy looked like he was a middle school president. Anybody remember that look that he had? And then he got Jeremy Boring and he got, uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh, David Limbaugh to boost him up. He wrote a book when he was 17. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I'm sure, uh, you know, his parents knowing David Limbaugh had nothing to do with that. There's great irony in watching alt-writers claim they should use the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others, while complaining that the left uses the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others. That's literally not at all what we're saying. Number one, that's not what we're saying. We're saying turning points shouldn't promote it. And number two, yeah, there's a big difference between the government promoting what's right and the government promoting what's wrong. I that I want America to fight wars for Israel. Nope. Nope. First yes, of all, Israel do. can take care of herself. Then why doesn't she? Israel can take care of herself. Then why the fuck doesn't she? Is she, you know, why, why doesn't Israel take care of itself? 
why do they need us occupying the Golan Heights, right? Or have, rather have troops stationed in Syria along the Israeli-Syrian border. Why do they need us in northeastern Syria to prevent the Assad government from consolidating control over Syria? Why do they need us to depose Saddam Hussein? That's what they wrote in the Clean Break Memo. That's what Wormser, Douglas Feith, Richard Pearl, that's what they all wrote in the Clean Break Memo in 1996 for Benjamin Netanyahu. And then they all got in the State Department and they waged war against Iraq and they, they, they planted the seeds for Syria. That's why they're always agitating for us to go to war with Iran, right? And that's why Ben Shapiro was in favor of all of it. Go back to any of his publications or his, rather, his, uh, his pieces back when he wrote for Town Hall 10 years ago from 2003. This guy was one of the ones that made the case for Iraq. Oh, well, they say I want war for Israel. Well, that's not true. Yes, it is. You were in favor of the war in Iraq. I believe you're in favor of regime change in Iran. Nick faced his own problems in the subsequent years being banned off all social media, being debanked and put on a no-fly list before sensationally returning to the mainstream growing a huge fan base on Rumble and his own network, Cozy TV, before being brought in as an advisor by Kanye West on the Yay 2024 movement. The Daily Wire would shake off the nuisance that was the Groyper War and well and truly establish itself as a major force in American political punditry. During the COVID years, Ben would controversially take every mainstream opinion on vaccines, lockdowns, before regretting doing so after the pandemic. I had well and truly jumped off the Daily Wire train years ago for a number of reasons. Ben's clear allegiance to Israel, his repeated stance that concern over demographics is racist, the exposure of Con Inc by the Groypers, and just becoming disillusioned with the futility of Reagan free market politics as the solution to all the world's woes. However, the major masking off moment for Ben Shapiro for the world at large was his 2023 renewed conflict between Israel and Palestine. This was a period where it seemed Ben himself said to hell with it and didn't hide the fact that he was not for free speech and anti-censorship when it came to an anti-Israeli stance, that he was a hawk when it came to a possible US intervention in a war with Iran and Israel's enemies, and that he was more than happy to delve into identity politics when it came to his people despite telling the Groypers that the topic was off limits and racist years ago. On October 7, 2023, Hamas launched Operation Al-Aqsa Flood firing 5,000 rockets at Israel. Palestinian militant groups also launched armed incursions from the Gaza Strip into the Gaza envelope of southern Israel. Hamas attacked various Israeli military bases and the Nova Music Festival, killing over 1,100 people, taking 250 Israeli citizens hostage. Hamas said its attack was in response to the continued Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories, the blockade of the Gaza Strip, the expansion of illegal Israeli settlements and rising Israeli settler violence. Needless to say, any innocent civilian killed or captured was a tragedy and did not deserve their fate. As in the case of any such war, such a violent attack would call for military retaliation against Hamas. However, as the world watched on, as the horror of the October 7th attacks unfolded, it was in the back of everyone's minds that with the Zionist supremacist party the Likud in charge and with Benjamin Netanyahu at its helm, there is going to be an absolute reckoning against every Palestinian man, woman and child who are unlucky enough to reside in the Gaza Strip. Discourse around this conflict became extremely toxic and polarized, with the pro-Palestine and pro-Israel sides at each other's throats over the level of appropriate Israeli retaliation. Zionists such as Ben Shapiro rigorously defended every Israeli move, stating that Israel has a right to defend itself, that such civilian casualties are inevitable while Hamas embeds itself in the Gaza Strip. As had always been the case, America and the Republican Party backed Israel intensely, showing just how much has been captured by the Israel lobby. We should be doing three things. One, support Israel, whatever they need, whenever they need it, no questions asked. Two, eliminate Hamas. Don't weaken them, eliminate them, because if we don't, they will do this again. And three, do whatever it takes to get our hostages home. But see the bigger picture of all of this. There would be no Hamas without Iran. And look at what the bigger story of this all is. You have China and Russia name themselves unlimited partners. Iran is their junior partner. Iran, China is importing all of its oil from Iran, sending billions of dollars their way that they support terrorism with. Russia is getting drones and missiles from Iran. Look at the three. What do they all have in common? They all want to destroy the West and they all hate America. It isn't a question of whether I felt it. Uh, the fact is that American Jews support Israel. Uh, and I understood that. And the fact is that every Jewish prime minister that I have known uh, has enlisted American Jews to bring as much pressure as possible in the political process on American presidents. That's understandable. I don't object to it. 
in America, let me put it this way, that seed was planted and you learned how to be a Jew in all sorts of different creative forms. You take that same seed of Jewish civilization and you put it in the sandy soil of Israel. Well, the roots have to go very deep in order to get water, but once they go deep, then you begin to have something so well rooted in its own soil and it begins to produce its own culture. And we've had this privilege in Israel of being able to, to if, if America is the how to be Jewish, we can tell you what it is to be Jewish, what it is to create a culture, what it is to speak in your own language and have drama and, and poetry and art that is Jewish. And we can become a Jewish, what it is to be Jewish. You take that same seed of Jewish civilization and now you take it and you bring it to the charred earth of Europe. Well, and as someone who I love very dearly once said, you know what? Where is the grass growing underneath the ashes? I want to tell you now. However, something was different this time. This recent part of the conflict, along with Elon Musk's free Twitter, served to badly expose just how violent, ruthless, and supremacist the Israeli state really is, and subsequently how obviously compromised any American senator or political pundit would have to be to support it. Since October 7th, when 1,100 Israelis were killed, there's been over 100,000 Palestinian casualties, a hospital was bombed, aid workers killed, and atrocity propaganda produced by pro-Israeli parties, which has never been proven. Many Israeli officials also exposed themselves saying such things as there is no innocence in Gaza, seemingly justifying the genocide of the Palestinian people. We are working, operating militarily according to rules of international law, period, unequivocally. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true, this rhetoric about civilians not, we, we're not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not true. They could have risen up, they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat, but we're at war. Interestingly, videos emerged of Israelis spitting on Christian worshippers in Israel, with an Israeli news network justifying it as an old Jewish tradition, something I thought I would highlight as the majority of the Daily Wire's viewers are traditional Christian conservatives. Over the next few months, the mask would well and truly be removed from Ben Shapiro, with Ben acting as a sort of propaganda wing for the Israeli government. Andrew Tate responded to Shapiro on Twitter stating that peace is always an option during wartime. After Ben scoffed at the UN's suggestion for peace talks, Ben then hammered Tate in a response over Tate's history with running a cam business. Tate then called Shapiro a warmonger in an interview with Piers Morgan. Ben is a warmonger. Ben has been wrong on basically every single issue you can name. He was with you with the vaccine and, and every other war. Ben is always calling for other people's young men to go and die in some war. He seems to love it. I don't know if he has short man syndrome, but he's always behind his desk calling about how important it is that big strong men like me go and die. And the reason he tweeted that and said that is because when Hamas and Israel, the very early in the conflict, I think it was three days in, were discussing possible peace talks, he tweeted, no, absolutely not, f them, kill them all. And I said, I said, Ben, as a man who's done his own fighting, because I've had a life of pain and violence, listen to me, peace is always worth a conversation. What I said is that we should always be prepared to at least discuss peace. He, because he's a warmonger, said, no, peace is not worth a conversation. You're this, you're that, da-da. Because he's always sitting behind his desk, he must have a booster chair, and he's always running his mouth trying to invoke violence and call for war. And I find it kind of hypocritical because a man who's so small he would die if he was slapped on the street, sitting behind a desk and screaming for other people to be annihilated, I think is kind of, it's worse than I actually think, I believe. It's insane. I believe if he was sitting here listening to this, he would say that what he's screaming for is for Jewish people in Israel to defend themselves. And all he's a Jewish ben man. All Ben does is call for war. And I agree. Defending yourself. That's not all he does. That's all he does. It's and calling all. for war and, call, and defending yourself is very different than genocide. Ben then attacked Tucker Carlson for suggesting America should be more concerned with its own issues than Israel's. You can see how much this means to Ben and how animated it gets him, which drew backlash from more people online, arguing that Ben has never shown so much conviction when it comes to US issues. You know, I've got four draft age children. So if you're playing recklessly fast and loose with their lives, then I have a right to despise you, and I do. So if you're Nikki Haley who's running for president or Ben Shapiro or half the people I see on television casually mentioning the possibility of nuclear war or sending Americans to fight in the Middle East or in any way involving us in a war that has nothing to do with prosperity and peace at home, nothing in other words to do with us Americans, then I have a right to call you out and be.
thousand a year. Now, you could call it genocide, you can call it whatever you want, but it's the death of over 100,000 Americans a year and the living death of millions Well, you can't more. call it genocide, it's not out. genocide. So sure. I, I don't understand. I'm sorry, people who are addicted people to are drugs and living outside. Israel. And again, I, I wanna add my voice to that because I'm a human being. But oh, sure you do. The you sound very outraged. The outrage among Republican presidential candidates was so much more intense. One of them took to a bullhorn and started yelling about it. I get it. But no one would think to do that about the 100,000 American young people murdered every year. And they because who are you yelling at? Who are you yelling at? First of all, people are on bullhorns yelling about drug overdoses and the open border all the time. All the time. What is he even talking about? What he's attempting to do is minimize what happened in Israel. He's not attempting to maximize what happened in the United States. He's attempting to minimize as though America can't walk and chew gum morally speaking at the same time, which is absurd. And those two things are nothing alike. I'm sorry, that is not alike. It is not alike for drug smugglers to smuggle drugs over the border, which someone then takes and shoves into their arm and then they dive in overdose. That is not the same thing. I promise you, it is not the same thing as a terrorist breaking into your home and murdering your children in their beds in front of you and dragging your wife off to be raped in Gaza. That is not the same thing. Pretending that it is, is immoral, uh, it's a moral blight, it's idiocy. It's just moral stupidity at the highest level. Of course we should care about what happens with fentanyl. Of course we should care about, all, we should close our border. Have I been unclear about this? Of course America should have closed borders when it comes to this sort of stuff. I'm on the same side as Tucker on that. I just don't understand why he's not on my side when it comes to Hamas has to be wiped off the face of the earth. Pause it right there. What exactly is the counter? Worst of all, in contradiction to what Ben had told the Groypers years before, Ben effectively said that America needs to join the war in support of Israel. Otherwise, the use of nuclear arms by Israel is not off the table. So the real risk for Israel in not finishing off Hamas right now is that this is taken as a sign of weakness, as it certainly would be, by Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a far more dangerous terrorist group than Hamas. Hamas is a dangerous terrorist group. They just proved it by killing 1,300 Jews. Hezbollah currently has over 100,000 highly sophisticated rockets aimed directly at the north of Israel. Estimates suggest that were Hezbollah to fire all of those rockets, we wouldn't be talking about 1,300 dead Jews. You would be talking about somewhere between 20 and 30,000 dead Jews, day one. If Hezbollah gets in, Israel will have no choice but to unleash the Air Force. If they unleash the Air Force, they're not going to be worried at that point about civilian casualties at all. They're simply going to have to eviscerate the entire south of Lebanon and topple the regime in Lebanon that supports Hezbollah. If that happens, Iran undoubtedly gets in and so does Syria. If that happens, and Israel is now faced with a with a full war in the north, combined with a war in the south, because they will not have defeated Hamas, that's the predicate. If Israel is forced to the wall, the possibility of nuclear exchange is extremely high. That is why it is very important that the United States provide the material aid to Israel. Hezbollah in the north, which is an Iranian proxy, will know that Israel is surrounded on all sides and may choose to launch a massive offensive against Israel that would end with tens of thousands of Jews dead and Israel itself existentially endangered. Again, that possibility is quite real. Israel is apparently holding off right now on its ground offensive in order to retain enough troops in the north to prevent a massive Hezbollah move. If Hezbollah jumps in, Israel will respond with everything in its arsenal as it would have to. Iran, then presumably with Russian and Chinese backing, could enter the conflict. At that point, nuclear conflict would certainly not be off the table. Israel will not allow a second Holocaust to take place without using everything in its arsenal. At some point in this chain of events, America would inevitably be dragged directly into such a war. Meanwhile, the world's oil supply would be radically decreased, crashing the global economy. So that's what one path looks like. The other path looks like America standing tall. And here's America's role. It's a simple role. It does not require American use of force. It does not require American soldiers. First, America must provide Israel the materiel and moral support to destroy Hamas. Israel will shed extraordinary levels of blood of its own citizens in order to protect civilians in Gaza and to kill terrorists. But Israel will require rearmament and America should provide it. And Israel wounded by Hamas is an invitation to broader regional and possibly global conflict. Second, America must use our diplomatic might to push to alleviate the situation on the Arab side. We ought to be pushing Egypt to open its border to refugees to minimize civilian casualties. We should be pushing Turkey to accept refugees. After all, they accepted 3.5 million of them from Syria. America ought to leverage Qatar into turning over Hamas's leadership to an international body or to America itself and push Qatar to get Hamas to release American and other hostages held by Hamas. Third, America must deter other actors from escalating this conflict. Presumably, that's why Joe Biden himself is visiting Israel and why America currently has aircraft carriers stationed in the Mediterranean. An ounce of prevention will be worth kilotons of cure. All of this is doable without expending significant amounts of American treasure or any American blood. But that can only happen if the Biden administration doesn't go wobbly.
Perhaps Ben's biggest career misstep and the moment when he well and truly overplayed his hand was his feud and subsequent firing of Candace Owens from the Daily Wire. The relationship between the two had been undoubtedly on shaky ground from the Yay 2024 saga. The feud well and truly kicked off when Owens tweeted about Israel's war on Gaza writing, No government anywhere has a right to commit a genocide, ever. There is no justification for a genocide. I can't believe this even needs to be said or has even been considered the least bit controversial to state. A video then appeared online of Ben calling Owens' behaviour disgraceful and accusing her of faux sophistication. Yes, uh, and then the question was about Candace Owens. I think her behavior during this is disgraceful. Without a doubt, Candace Owens. I can't close that. Yeah, yeah, and I think she's been absolutely disgraceful. I think that I think that her her faux sophistication on these particular issues has been ridiculous. It's not faux sophistication; it's ridiculous. Everybody can see the moves that she's making and the things that she's saying, and I find them disreputable. Owens wrote in response, quoting Matthew in the New Testament, You cannot serve both God and money, to which Shapiro said she was free to leave the Daily Wire at any moment. Candace, under constant attack from the Zionist media and the ADL, began to feel more emboldened, calling out, quote, political Jews who used her identity as a shield from criticism. Candace, like Tucker Carlson, began to openly espouse a more American first position, stating that her crime was not believing that American taxpayers should have to pay for Israel's wars or the wars of any other country. I am here today to endorse Nikki Haley for president of Israel. I think she's earned that. I think Bibi Netanyahu is going through a very bad time right now. Support for Israel has virtually collapsed socially. If you're paying attention to the trends and you're paying attention to what people are watching, you're paying attention to the protests. And the one person that I think is capable of getting it back is Nikki Haley with a, enough money from foreign interest lobbies. So there it is, guys. I'm endorsing Nikki Haley, president of Israel. There are a lot yeah. of people in America that are sitting here going, okay, well, can you answer why Jews are so special? Because as white people in this country and on, on university campuses, we are being taught that we are not allowed to have a voice. We have had to endure exactly what you're talking about, BLM. We've endured much worse than you have because it's in the actual textbooks. We are being told that we are systematically racist, that we are born wrong because of the color of our skin. And if we say mm -hmm. anything, we'll lose everything. This is the typical experience on white campuses. So people, this is not what about us. And this is like actually what we have been fighting for years. So it sort mm -hmm. of arrived as I think for a lot of Americans, a surprise when they're saying, well, now that it's about Israel, which is something that's overseas, we need to you know, hand these university professors, we need to do something about this issue. Why weren't we trying to correct course on this issue? Why weren't donors pulling their funding out of these universities? Why weren't these same things being said for these last, I would say eight years of rampant BLM, white man can't do anything right actively being taught in the classrooms. So there are people that are asking that question now. What I have said is that explicit calls for genocide, which was stunning to me to see that in, oh. in, in Congress, are completely wrong. It is com frankly crazy. I have not Things began to reach a boiling point with Owens' back and forth with various rabbis until eventually Jeremy Boring took to Twitter to announce that the Daily Wire had parted ways with Candace Owens. In response, Candace merely tweeted, The rumors are true, I'm finally free. Of course, this couldn't have been a worse look for the Daily Wire, with many people rightly stating that Candace had the freedom to say whatever she wanted until it came to what was very mild criticism of Israel and sympathy towards the Palestinians. Andrew Claven, an employee of the Daily Wire, took to his show to announce that the phrase Christ as King is anti-Semitic, while popular podcasters Andrew Schulz and Patrick Matt David criticized Ben stating that the Daily Wire is essentially an Israeli wing of American media makes the argument for censorship. He calls it something else. Yeah, I forget the term I have it in my phone. But he, I don't even think he's using the term right, but he's basically like, there's a window of ideas we accept. Yes. And we accept ideas between this, uh, this, I guess this is, if I get window, you're looking like this. So we accept ideas between here and here. And anything outside of that window, well, you're fireable. That's censorship. What? But yeah. he's acting as if this is like, a justified reason for firing people when you built your identity and platform off of no censorship and freedom of yes, speech and yeah. facts don't care about your feelings and all this shit. It's also funny that that window happens to end where his beliefs end. I am Isn't that interesting? You would say well, that. Not being pro-Israel, that's where the window ends. That's what? also your specific personal belief. What? So. I just so don't you see. you can't have an opinion on your platform that is not pro 
a country that is not ours? Hmm. Yeah. Wait a minute. Crazy. I wish. So wait, is I the Daily Wire time. an American media platform or is it an Israeli oh. media platform? <laughs> I'm just asking. CBN is what? What does CBN stand for? Christian, Christian Broadcasting, Broadcasting Network. Broadcasting Network. It's, not, it's not, you know, a RBN, Religious Broadcasting no. Network. It's what? Christian. Christian Broadcasting Network. Daily Wire can be Daily DJW, Daily Jewish Wire. Or DIW, Daily Israel Wire. No problem. Yeah. If that's your value, stick to that. Candace and Ben have continued to take shots at each other on social media, suggesting a debate, but this is yet to come to fruition. And here we are. We have Ben Shapiro, a man whose rhetoric has been vastly different when it comes to what he preaches for the US and Israel, who is happy to use left's tactics against anyone to the right of him, such as Nick Fuentes. And when it comes to criticizing or even simply asking questions with regard to Israel, he is not indeed a free speech advocate. I made this video in the hopes that the Daily Wire and Turning Point USA's audience may come across it. American Christians who have long been psyoped into supporting Israel by the American conservative establishment, so that they may discover that the base which they have been led to believe has their best interests at heart is inherently anti-Christian, and if push comes to shove will send their sons to die in a war in the Middle East as to not offend their donors. We have literally tens of millions of people in the United States who are afraid that the cancel culture is coming for them. And cancel culture does exist. Okay, so what this results in very, very often is corporations looking to cram down a particular viewpoint on you and then cancel you. When it comes to the hosts on The Daily Wire, obviously everyone is able to say what they want. But the reality is that there is an Overton window at The Daily Wire. There, there are polls out there that show that a vast majority of Americans in every single political group, including liberals, feel like they cannot say what they want to say in public because they're afraid that they are going to be canceled, fired, cast out from polite society. This actually happened to a socialist moron named Nathan Robinson. He got canceled from The Guardian. And he said he got canceled from The Guardian because he had put up some anti-Israel tweets. Okay, now I think he's an idiot. I think that his views on Israel are abhorrent but I don't think that he should lose his columnist slot over at The Guardian. That's a different story, obviously, when it comes to any publisher. Any publisher gets to make decisions about what it wishes to, uh, what it wishes to purvey and not. He certainly would not defend anybody on the other side who got canceled. In fact, he has repeatedly said cancel culture does not exist, okay? It does exist. The fact that there are people out there who want you to lose your job for the sin of saying things they don't agree with is extraordinarily real, and it is happening on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. You know, the, the Daily Wire is a, a publisher, not a platform. Publishers obviously have to decide what sort of things they wish to pay for the publication of. And uh, and when it comes to, you know, you know hosts and, and publishers, you know, parting ways, obviously there will be a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there was a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on this.